Over the last century, the Coachella Valley has been one of the most sought after vacation destinations in North America, all while possessing some of the most productive farmland in the world. So how did a previously barren desert evolve into a desert paradise? The answer, water. And on today's episode of Uncovered in the Archives, we will wander through this Southern California desert to unravel the history of H2O in the Coachella Valley. That's coming up on Uncovered in the Archives. Uncovered in the Archives is made possible in part by Loma Linda University Health. The City of Riverside, California. The County of Riverside, California. The City of La Quinta, California. And by contributions to your PBS station by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Uncovered in the Archives. I'm your host, Brad Pomerantz. Now let's face it, even the most seasoned among us may not truly comprehend the dramatic transformation that the Coachella Valley has experienced over the last century. But have no fear, Tom Levy, who served the Coachella Valley Water District from 1972 to 2002, can shed some light on the epic evolution of this inland desert. I wanna get a sense, what was this valley like, let's say 18th, 19th century? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> If you driven to the 10 to Blythe. So that's east, going east, east in California. East of here, uh, it looked like that. Who was living in this valley in those years? In the early years, it was the Cahuilla Indians. And we've seen pictures of the Cahuilla Indians in the archives. Have a number of tribes that have reservations here. So by the mid to late uh, 19th century, the railroad comes through. We have folks starting to migrate to this region. What started to happen in the late 19th, early 20th century with that migration to this valley? When the railroad came through, uh, they drilled a well and it was artesian. The water shot out like the old pictures you see of oil wells uh, with the water coming out. People realized you could grow crops here and with the warm winters, you could grow them, uh, put them on the railroad, either headed to LA or headed back east and get high value for your crop. Now the families of two residents still living in the Coachella Valley today were among those early pioneers who moved to the region to try their hand at farming these desert lands. So let's talk to Pat Laughlin and Connie Cowan at the Coachella Valley History Museum. Tell us about your husband's family. Well, my father-in-law came in 1911. He and three fraternity brothers from UC Berkeley heard about land down here. And the four came down and homesteaded a whole section. I was looking through the archives and we found a photograph of your father-in-law. Mm -hmm. He is standing in front of an artesian well. Yes. There's water literally bubbling out from the earth. At least 120 feet in the air. Explain how that happened. How was it that water was bubbling out of the earth? Well, there was a wonderful uh, water table under the valley that the railroad really discovered when they put down their deep wells to get water for their steam engines. And Mr. Laughlin happened to have one of those deep wells, a thousand feet deep, and it flowed continuously. We also found in the archives a photograph of your husband as a little toddler. Yes. He's with, is it your, his, it's gra his grandmother? His grandmother. Yes. Where was that picture taken? It was taken here in the valley when cotton was king. Wow. Because that was the big crop in the 20s. Tell us about your dad, uh, Mr. Don Mitchell. Well, he was working in the lemons in Santa Paula and Ventura as a packing house manager. And he had friends, the date industry was just getting started. 20s, mid 1920s? Uh, he came in 1926. And uh, my, he brought my mother here in 1928. 
and her friends thought she was moving off the face of the earth. <laughs> I believe it. What was life like in the 30s and the 40s with agriculture starting to become even more successful, but not a lot of people no, in the region? No, One of the special childhood memories is walking down between the rows of the very tall date palms and you walk down inside and it's almost to me like walking into a cathedral. It's it's a beautiful feeling walking in those, pa yeah, those date big palms date are rows. beautiful. Mm -hmm. They are beautiful trees, no doubt. With the proliferation of agriculture, of more folks moving in, water became an issue. There were fights with regard to the Whitewater River. What happened to calm those concerns, those fears? People recognized that for the valley to grow, you needed to have another source of water. And people said, hey, there's the Colorado River uh, over there. Imperial Irrigation District was talking about uh, trying to get a canal in the United States. There were fights between arguments, whatever, between IID <laughs> and the Coachella Valley. Now, Mark Twain famously said, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting over. I think Steve Abbott, one of the region's most preeminent water lawyers, can best describe the uh, fighting over water. The Coachella Valley and the Imperial Valley started to fight over access. The original proposal was to have the lands of the Coachella Valley Water District become part of the Imperial Irrigation District. Well, as the Depression hit and the finances of the Imperial Irrigation District became very suspect, the farmers in the Coachella Valley were very concerned that if they merged into Imperial, their lands would be assessed the taxes to pay IID's debt. They wanted no part of that. And so they recalled the entire board of directors. Literally, there was an election. I've, I've seen those documents. A recall election. Yes. A recall election. And they recalled the entire board of directors, elected a brand new board, who instead said, we want our own contract with the Secretary of Interior for Colorado River Water. In 1934 or 35, the voters in the district uh, ratified the contract where the district would pay $13.5 million to build a separate uh, canal from the All-American up to the Coachella Valley. I ran some quick numbers on it, and that's like $150 million. $150 million. $150 million. The Coachella Canal got as far as the county line between Imperial and Riverside counties when World War II broke out. Mm -hmm. And the needs of the war were priority number one. All construction was suspended, and the resources were developed, devoted to the war effort. But with the conclusion of World War II, I understand construction picked up tremendous steam. And yeah, they finished the canal in 1947. But, but they had a minor problem uh, getting it from the end of the canal to the uh, farms. Distribution, Distribution was the problem? They, again, voted to do another $13.5 million contract. So now we're basically at $300 million in modern day dollars? Uh, probably 350 to 400. And yet again, some trailblazers saw the awesome opportunities available in agriculture in the Coachella Valley and decided to give it a go in this Southern California desert. One such groundbreaker, Palmer Powell, the grandfather of John Powell. And today, John runs Peter Rabbit Farms and serves as the president of the Coachella Valley Water District. Right. What happened in 1950, just as the Coachella branch of the All-American Canal is coming online? The explosion of farms, even before 1950, because people were anticipating that this was going to happen. Ultimately, your grandfather, Palmer Powell, decided to develop his own farm. Tremendous foresight. Tell us about that. So he had the ability to distribute a lot of produce, and at some point realized he wanted to control the supply. So they started leasing and, and even buying little uh, areas, plots of land, uh, and uh, farming their own produce so that they wouldn't run out. 
So in those early years, given that the name of your farm is Peter Rabbit, am I to presume that carrots are and were an important crop to your carrots, family? Carrots, definitely. Carrots were very important, even as early as the 1950s. He started bagging the carrots and putting the, the name Peter Rabbit on that, and we still are using that brand today. In the distance, one of your farming colleagues, I believe, is growing table grapes, is that right? right? Right. Tell us about Ta table grapes, because I understand they're still a very important crop. Table grapes region. have definitely been the number one crop in the Coachella Valley uh, for decades. I know that in the early years, early part of the 20th century, dates came in, it became very kind of exotic. Uh, there was this whole Arabian theme around the dates. Could you tell us a bit about that? Right, well, dates are still a big crop in the Coachella Valley, and we have some dates right here, so we can go take a look. Okay, let's go. So this is our Daglet Nora dates, hmm. and this is what they look like before we put the bags on. And it's a the most popular variety in the valley. It's a commercial date that can be used for a variety of things. Uh, currently very popular in energy bars. They're used in, in cereals and eaten fresh, uh, sold all over the country. Yeah. What makes dates so fond of being grown in the Middle East, North Africa, and now here in the desert of the Coachella Valley? Well, we have a lot of heat here, and the dates right. love the heat. Uh, you know, the summertime highs can be in the one teens to one twenty, uh, and uh, of course we have water, and we're able to grow in a, in a really nice soil. And let me ask you about that water, because you have water coming onto this farm from the Colorado River through the Coachella branch of the All American Canal. Describe the trip of the water all the way from the Colorado River. Well, it's hard to believe that water gets here entirely by gravity. Wow. So we're at pretty low elevation here, and it, and it flows the entire way, gets pretty much all the way to the Mexican border. At the Imperial Dam, it turns north and heads back into the Coachella Valley, where it continues downhill and gets distributed to this ranch and other ranches in the Coachella Valley. Now, the farmers were not the only ones who saw opportunity in the Coachella Valley. Thanks to the significant supply of water, the titans of tourism decided that the destiny of the desert was to become a jet set destination. Linda Evans, mayor of La Quinta and chair of the Greater Palm Springs Visitors Bureau knows all about that. Let's join Mayor Evans at the Silver Rock Resort. When we think about the history of this valley, it was in the late 40s, early 50s that the Coachella branch of the All-American Canal was essentially completed, mm -hmm. delivering much needed water to this region. I don't think it's a coincidence that it was around that time when we started to see even more resorts, golf courses being developed, Th the Thunderbird Country Club, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Tamaris Country Club, the Eldorado Country Club. That was all happening in the 50s. Absolutely, and water has driven every bit of it. So I've looked in the archives mm -hmm. and I've seen some of the greats of the 50s and 60s come to this great valley. It really was the place to be. And it's amazing when you look Look at not only the Hollywood stars and how we've named our streets and we've named some of our areas. For visitors today, it may have that historic value, but there's still a draw to be here because it's a destination getaway. And let's talk about the playground for presidents. Dwight D. Eisenhower, I think, was kind of the first president mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to realize the beauty of this valley. And after him, successive presidents, JFK, LBJ, uh, Gerald Ford, Ford Nixon, what is it about the valley? Well, obviously we have the Annenberg Estate, and so that is their west coast kind of Camp David. And we have the capabilities and capacity to be able to provide them a secure environment, and obviously golf, as well as other respite components. Let's talk about golf and golf courses, mm -hmm. because it's hard to deny that golf is not a huge driver driver <laughs> in this great yes. valley. I learned recently, I think 10% of all golf courses in California are in the Coachella Valley. It's considered the Western capital mm. of golf. Let's get some insight from golf expert, author and reporter, Larry Bohannon. As I understand it, sir, the first true golf course was built in this region in, is it 1924? There was a hotel in Palm Springs called the Desert Inn and Nellie Kaufman, who ran it, started noticing that some of her guests were driving all the way into Riverside to play golf. So she started building holes of golf between the bungalows of her hotel. And those were the really the first holes of golf in the Coachella Valley. But then in 1926, 27, the legendary La Quinta Hotel was built 
right. with an accompanying golf course. Walter Morgan, a San Francisco businessman, fell in love with this area and decided he wanted to build a hotel here, even though it was 20 miles from Palm Springs. Mm. And then just a few months later, Thomas O'Donnell, a very, very wealthy oil man, right. uh, decided to build a home and a golf course right next to Nellie Kaufman's Desert Inn in Palm Springs, and that became O'Donnell Golf Course, and that's the longest existing golf course in the desert. It still is sitting there today. So as you know, in the late 40s and early 50s, water was brought in right. to this region through the Coachella branch of the All-American Canal. Right. That allowed for a proliferation of golf courses. Right. And sure enough, one of the epic golf courses built in that time, 1951, it's the Thunderbird Country Club. Thunderbird Country Club was a failing dude ranch ah. in the 1940s and early 1950s, and somebody got the idea that if they built a golf course there, maybe they could sell some home lots around the golf course for $2,000 each. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. So they got a guy named Johnny Dawson, who was a very good amateur golfer and who had connections in the Los Angeles area, to come out and build the golf course and bring some of his Hollywood friends out to buy homes and that was really the first 18 hole golf course that was built in in the desert and that was followed just right one year later uh by tamarisk country club which was the jewish club in the mm. valley so what you had in the at tamarisk was you had the jewish stars which were danny k jack benny the marx brothers right. people like that i want to ask you about another golf course built in the 1950s the el dorado I understand that the uh, sitting president at the time enjoyed that course. Is that fair, sir? Dwight Eisenhower came to the desert first in 1954, mm. actually. When they built El Dorado in 1957, he played there. They made him an honorary member, and he liked it so much, he decided he was going to build a home there. I've looked through the archives, mm -hmm. and I've seen that golf courses in this valley have been doing their best to try to be water wise. Can you give us a sense of what the area golf courses have done to recognize the importance of sustainable water use? What the courses have done overall, they've been the best conservers of water over the years, even before the drought occurred and it was required and mandated. And it's turf reduction, it's water tolerant plants, it's fairways that go dormant in the months that we mm. don't need to water them extensively and grow them in our hot summers. And it provides still an aesthetically pleasing and beautiful environment. So by using canal water, that means the golf courses are not accessing groundwater, thereby depleting the important aquifer. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the misnomers that we're trying to communicate in the hospitality industry is people come to our valley and see the green golf courses and how lush the resorts are. And they think we're water wasteful when, in fact, we have been conserving water in this valley better than anybody. Protecting that access, that supply of water took a lot of hard work. Let's harken back a few decades with Tom Levy so he can explain. The problem comes in the 1990s, though, because through the exponential growth in this region. You have groundwater wells being drilled, and we started to face what we know as an overdraft problem of the groundwater basin. Explain what was happening. Okay, what ha was happening is you had more uh, water being taken out of the groundwater basin than was flowing in. So I understand that the parties came together as they've ultimately done over the last 100 plus years. How did they come together to resolve the groundwater crisis? The state legislature had set a deadline for the parties to sign a quantification settlement agreement. So we held a formal signing ceremony at Hoover Dam, and the Secretary of Interior was there. So in this area, with the sand and rock coming out of these mountains, water can percolate yeah. and go into the groundwater basin. So as a result, the district decided that this site would be perfect to develop a groundwater replenishment facility. They named it after you. Where are we getting this water that is being pumped in and percolating into the basin? It's Colorado River water. It comes about 122 miles to get to this location and we percolated in the ground. It raised the water levels here in the lower valley. Uh, we have wells that they went down and they weren't artesian, and now they're artesian again. And what's remarkable about the fact that this facility is named after you is it's been here for over a decade, and this is your 
third visit? Yeah. Come on, I would be here every day, <laughs> jumping for joy, swimming. I probably couldn't do that, but. Now, even though new agreements have been put in place and new facilities have gone online, the work to remain water wise is never done. So let's go ask Carrie Oliphant, Assistant Director of Engineering at the Coachella Valley Water District to explain more about these initiatives. Carrie, I've been looking through the archives and I've noticed that over the last decade or so, recycling has become increasingly important. Explain to us what's happening on the recycling front. So back in 2009, uh, we, a, a pump station was constructed about seven miles from the location that we're at today and a 54 inch pipeline um, was constructed to bring um, Colorado River water here to this location. 54 inches. In diameter. That's, that's big. That's very big. And it's but, coming from the Coachella branch of the All-American Canal. That's correct. Okay. The golf courses still have a high demand for, for water usage. And so the recycled water that is produced at our wastewater treatment plant. And let's talk about the wastewater treatment plant. Okay. The waste goes through um, several treatment processes. And when you say waste, you mean human, human waste. waste. Right. It's remarkable. People don't realize, but that water can you be reused. It can, and it is. It goes through um, several processes in order to be able to be used as recycled water. And um, when it is, able to be used on golf courses. It's distributed through purple pipes. Ah. And in the summertime, it's blended with Colorado River water. Which is which what's is behind us. Behind us here. So that the golf courses aren't pumping groundwater. They are using either recycled water or the Colorado River water. And we kind of blend that together and call it non-potable water. But as I understand it, when you combine what's happening at the Levy facility right. with what will be happening here right. at this Palm Desert recharge replenishment facility, right. the aquifer is going to be uh, it won't be thirsty. Right. It, it will be well, it's, it's thirst will be quenched. Right. This project will definitely satisfy um, a huge accomplishment in terms of getting the groundwater basin replenished in the Mid Valley area. Now, in addition to major projects, everyday consumers of water can and have taken steps to be water wise in the inland desert region. So let's go inside and talk to Katie Evans. Katie serves as the Director of Communications and Conservation at the Coachella Valley Water District, and she'll help us unravel some of these conservation programs. So in other parts of the state during the drought, let's call it drought tolerant plants became desert chic. Mm -hmm. You had been doing that for years anyway, yeah. but you continued and have continued to ramp up, I'll call it desert chic. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your program towards drought tolerance. We've had a program in place for a long time to incentivize people to remove grass and replace it with desert friendly or drought tolerant landscaping. We pay them to do that based on a square footage removal. Katie, in addition to turf removal for residences, there are other programs in place. You brought props. I love when people do that. What exactly is this? I'm going to hand it to you. So this is uh, just another really good way that homeowners can be more efficient in their water use by adding a pressure regulator to their existing valves, which everybody would have on their house. They can make sure we're not overspraying, misting, sending water sure. all over the place, and water their turf more efficiently. More show and tell. You brought another fairly large object, <laughs> but important one. I'll hold it for you, Katie. Thank what you. is this? So this device is so cool. It's called the Smart Irrigation Controller. Everybody probably has an irrigation controller at their house right now. It's just like this, it tells your sprinklers when to turn off, turn on, and for how sure. long to run. But this one has this handy little guy. It's a weather station that we attach to your roof. So we'll set this controller, but it will adjust itself every single day based on the weather that day. It's phenomenal. It, um, it's amazing, and it's such a great technology to help people be more efficient. And let's talk about agriculture. What have they done? What do they continue to do? to conserve water. So here in the Coachella Valley, our agricultural industry has really taken some innovative steps in water efficiency, and they did that a long time ago. Very little of our, our agricultural customers are using big spray irrigation mm -hmm. anymore. They're using micro spray, they're using drip, um, and they're irrigating in a more efficient way. That's really good for us because it helps us manage our water better, but it also helps them make sure that the water use is, is more precise and so that when they're trying to grow a vibrant crop, they're able to do so uh, by being more careful and, and more conscious of their water use. When we look towards the future, we need to consider climate change. Mm -hmm. 
What is this region doing to prepare for a potential other drought? It's likely will happen, just the cycle of nature. Yeah. So we're, we're always preparing for a drought and we operate here in the desert as if we're always in a drought mm. because we are. <laughs> um, so conservation for us, water efficiency for us is a really wide portfolio of things. It's recycled water. It's using the canal water on agriculture. Uh, it's a whole host of different things. One of which is those conservation programs that we've talked about. In 1918, the leaders of the Coachella Valley realized that water, mankind's most precious resource, had to be protected and preserved. 100 years later, the Coachella Valley Water District celebrates its 100th anniversary and thanks those forward-thinking pioneers of the early 20th century. We hope that you enjoyed this hop through the history of H2O in the Coachella Valley. Please join us next time to see what we've uncovered in the archives. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Uncovered in the Archives is made possible in part by Loma Linda University Health. The City of Riverside, California. The County of Riverside, California. The City of La Quinta, California. And by contributions to your PBS station by viewers like you. Thank you.